Cool, so this came out of a training course that me and Jeff went to in London, and this is one of the most interesting uh, bits of that that I thought. So measuring technical debt and why it matters. So it matters because you get what you measure. Um, if you give a team a particular statistic and say you're going to be measured on this statistic, the team are going to move that in the direction that you want them to move it in, even if that means that the code doesn't actually get any better. So we have to choose a measure for technical debt such that when we actually put in the effort to pay back the technical debt, the time investment is actually worth it. So the first, so the talk is basically about two measurement approaches. So this is the first one, which is the delta from ideal. And basically you define a whole bunch of metrics um, where you know what the ideal looks like. You can look at your code and see what you're currently scoring on that metric. And then you just kind of look at where you are. So the first metric, so these are just example metrics you can pick your own. So the first metric you might look at is how many compiler errors and warnings we've got. So this is the SQL compare UI, which includes <laughs> compare engine and everything else. And it, it compiles on my machine, brilliant. Um, but there's a thousand warnings. And so if we were to spend time reducing that warning count, are we actually making the code better? Probably not. Um, with sharper errors, there's nearly 20,000 for sharper errors across two and a half thousand files. If you put the time in to make those better, and reduce that count, are we actually making the code better? Probably not. Uh, code duplication. So this is using the code analysis tools in Visual Studio Ultimate uh, across the compare engine. It found 50 of exact matches, 25 strong, da, 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 da. And if you put the type, so these clearly, if we fix these, it would make the code better because most of these are just, the next bug fix away won't fix the bug properly because you'll fix it in one of the things, but you won't deal with the, the duplicated code. So there, you are making the code better. Um, next up is unit test coverage. This is the um, SQL source control and the plugin that we're writing for DM. Um, again, pushing these numbers up, clearly you are making the code better. Um, and finally is just add gut feel. So the read is for we can measure automatically, but gut feeling, not so much. So this is the, the work class in compare. It's a partial class, but across four files. Um, and the files are quite big. Um, they're so big that the sharpers and is a bit slow when you're dealing with these files. Um, and so clearly, yes, we could put time in to fix this, but again, are we actually making the application better? Um, so basically, in some way, you have to pick the metrics carefully, otherwise there'll be a high opportunity cost of fixing that metric, like the compile warnings we started at the beginning. And then next up, in a large application with an awful lot of technical debt, this measure is basically useless because you're going to end up with something like this where it's just insurmountable to deal with this, or your unit test coverage will be basically zero, and it's just insurmountable to deal with that. So this is the approach that um, the guy on the course recommended. So instead of kind of looking at the entire application and looking at metrics over it, you basically look at the things that you're actually gonna have to change. Um, because some of the application just will sit there and don't need changing. But more interesting is the bits that you're going to change and how those bits affect the technical debt. So for this approach, you need some stories, um, which can either come from the backlog or they can be hypothetical. And then you estimate them, just as Scrum has taught us to. So we give them points, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 20. And then the assumption behind the approach is that technical debt increases that estimate because technical debt makes that code harder to change. And so what we get to do is, in three months' time, we can re-estimate again. And we can see if the estimates have gone up, this means our technical debt has increased. We can also use it after a refactoring to see if the technical debt is reduced. And interestingly, we can use it after a hypothetical refactoring. So we can say, if we were to make this change to our code base, would it make that feature that our product manager wants or that our product manager might want in the future easier to do? And if the answer is yes, then clearly you should do it before the feature is implemented. And if the answer is no, then if it's not actually making it easier to add features, then is there much point actually doing that change when you can spend your time focusing on something else? Um, there are some interesting corollaries with this approach. Um, let me just check we did. We, so yeah, we've done that slide. Some interesting corollaries with this approach. The first is that actually to reduce your technical debt, you don't actually have to make the code any better. So if you can increase the team's understanding of the code, maybe there's an abstraction layer that doesn't quite work, um, it's too leaky or whatever, but if the team's understanding of the code is increased, then that means that the technical debt is reduced. So this basically encompasses what you know that if you have the basically if you replace the, the software developers on the team with another set of software developers, they lose the um, their inbuilt mental model, and so the technical debt goes up. So if you keep the team stable over time, you can see that um, technical debt is essentially lowered by having a team that understands the code. The real problem with this approach is imagine the estimate used to be five. We do some refactoring; it's now three. But what does that mean in practice? Have we actually reduced the technical debt? 
So what are the error bars on this? If, if it's 5 plus minus 2 and it's 3 plus minus 2, then is our code actually got any better? So it basically means that you get to inherit all of the problems that come from estimating into technical debt calculation. So you can't really use it to kind of be um, quantitative, but you can use it to be qualitative. So if I did this refactoring, it would reduce it, but as to how much or whether it would reduce it every single time. It's quite hard. Cool. No, I know everyone. Any questions? Mark? So I really like the idea of storing programming in that it ties. I hate technical debt. I think we need to stop using phrase technical debt because I think it's just so massively um, overloaded and confusing that it serves no purpose whatsoever. Um, I like the idea of tying this to um, our delivery of software and value to, to users. Okay. Is doing this set of changes more likely to help us deliver features that we're actually going to do to users more, more quickly? I guess my point is around the estimation. You might be able to mitigate that by estimating in access to hours. I think story points are entirely incorrect. An incorrect sort of approach to measure this because you're over the time that you're likely to change the software, your story points are naturally going to fluctuate to some degree anyway. Story points that only make sense over a long period, average over a long period of time, don't make sense for the sort of point estimate. Whereas if you would say, well, last time we estimated that you know swapping out the you know, um, SQL Server backend for Oracle backend would take us you know, 20 days, and now you know, we can do that in three. That's maybe a day. Let's do really but I think, I think if you chose a sensible estimate, you might be able to make this work. Um, I didn't see where you were about the error bars, because estimating story size is really, really hard. Um, but I guess I'd say that. Um, mostly the error bars tend to represent the unknown. So you get in there and you find a bug, it's like, oh crap, I had to do all of this stuff I didn't, I didn't think about. But the question is, are you likely to have changed that unknown code for the works by doing that? Like that? So your error, your error is probably unchanged or positively improved yes. by doing the refactoring. So if you've gone from a five to a three, you've probably got a minimum of two Yes. The problem is when it's a hypothetical refactoring. So if you're using an actual refactoring to increase your understanding of the code, which therefore lets you reduce the error, but if it's a hypothetical refactoring because you're not sure if you're going to make it yet or not, then that doesn't apply quite so much. But yeah, I agree. But remembering at the same time that if you're doing, obviously careful communication, etc. If you're doing the refactoring, then if you're, the rest of your team has a lot of knowledge about the existing code base, then you're potentially increasing the load for the future for when they work on that code. Oh, obviously, we're doing that. My mind's about the, yeah, the idea of technical debt. That if you, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really bad term to use. We say, so we say, we say, well, you get a loan, you're reducing technical debt. No, you're not. You're reducing it hard, it hard to make any feature change, but that's not technical debt, is why it's having this done with it. And also, I'm not sure how a hypothetical refraction is ever going to work. But if you've got. It's like, if I, if I, if I could rewrite it all from scratch in a week, then yes. But it's, but it's a hypothetical refraction, not a hypothetical rewrite. So it lets you work out the opportunity cost of doing various things, because you say... I, I, I think just the cost of that happens in factoring is probably hard to actually estimate in terms of actually doing it. If you, if you would actually do it, then it actually might have a lot more than you expect. Thanks, David. Cool.